welcome to this week's Mountain West ADC Echo. My name is Brian Wood, Medical Director, and I will turn it over to today's speaker. Great. Thank you again for having me, and I'm sorry I'm a little late here. So we'll talk about hematologic manifestations of HIV, specifically a few of them. There's, there's a plethora of hematologic manifestations of, of HIV. I do not have any conflicts of interest or relationships to, to disclose. So I'll start off with a case that was seen recently at Harborview, give some brief information about this woman now and then we'll talk more about her at the end. So she's a 45-year-old woman who presented to her primary care doctor with abdominal pain and dysuria. She was diagnosed with a UTI and was prescribed nitrofurantoin. 24 hours later, she developed a, a pustular facial rash and went back to her primary doctor who advised her to go to the ED. She, at the ED, she was found to have a white blood cell count of 1.2, a hemoglobin of 5.8, and a platelet count of 23, so pancytopenic. Her past medical history was otherwise unremarkable. She, had, she was not taking any other medicines other than the nitrofurantoin to this point. So like this woman, cytopenias are common among patients living with HIV. The patient that I just described actually was not known to have HIV, though she subsequently was diagnosed with HIV during that initial hospitalization. It, uh, the cytopenias correlates with the degree of immunosuppression. Some of this data is from, a, from the early times, uh, pre-protease inhibitor time period, but anemia we think that in asymptomatic patients with HIV is up to nearly 20% of patients are anemic. About 20 to 50% are, are anemic who have symptomatic with middle stage HIV. And then nearly two thirds of patients who have AIDS are anemic. Thrombocytopenia is much smaller in terms of its prevalence among HIV positive patients, less than 2% among asymptomatic patients slightly higher among symptomatic middle stage patients, and then up to 10% with patients who have AIDS. And neutropenia is 10 to 30% in the asymptomatic and symptomatic early to middle stage disease, and greater than 50% in AIDS. Of note, just like the patient in this that I briefly described, one of these cytopenias may be an initial manifestation of HIV, and you all know this better than I do, but oftentimes just seeing a patient with thrombocytopenia by itself enables us to, to do the subsequent testing as was done with this patient. So from, just in the interest of time, I will just primarily talk about thrombocytopenia and neutropenia. Each of these talks could be an hour long talk by itself. So I'll just talk about briefly about thrombocytopenia and neutropenia and save anemia for later, but please feel free to ask me any questions. There are the other hematologic malignancies that, uh, or hematologic disorders that uh, we're not talking about today, but I can answer any questions or come back at a later time. Importantly include uh, coagulation defects, including the increased risk of thromboses that we see. And actually, uh, Dr. Heidi Crane from here will be presenting some data on the increased risk of venothromboembolism at the upcoming CROI meeting in a few weeks. So all of these cytopenias are multifactorial. They are a result of a direct toxicity of the virus itself. The inflammatory milieu that we know uh, suppresses the bone marrow. HIV opportunistic infections which can invade the bone marrow or malignancies which also can invade the uh, bone marrow. Malnutrition which are, uh, which is increased among patients who are HIV positive, mm -hmm. and therapy related, whether it's from antiretroviral medications or medications for prophylaxis for opportunistic infections or for therapy for a malignancy, for example. So we'll talk about thrombocytopenia. The incidence has definitely decreased with the introduction of antiretroviral therapy. Low CD4 count, increased viral load, uh, hepatitis C virus co-infection, age greater than 50, IV drug use, and uh, concomitant anemia increase the risk of thrombocytopenia. The etiologies, again, are varied from medications, IT, uh, immune dysregulation, which results in a ITP-like uh, syndrome, thrombotic microangiopathy, um, such as 
TTP, which is much higher risk among patients who are HIV positive, and hypersplenism, which may be a sequela of, of cirrhosis or liver disease. So the medications associated with thrombocytopenia, again, all of our chemotherapeutics are associated with thrombocytopenia. The, the viral, antiviral medications, gancyclovir or valgancyclovir, heparin, both in terms of increasing the risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, but also thrombocytopenia independent of that antibody-mediated phenomenon. The increased risk of, of, of HIT is, uh, is dramatic in patients who are HIV positive. Quinine or quinidine, sulfa, and thiazide diuretics. So when we look at a patient who has thrombocytopenia, and do a bone marrow biopsy, and oftentimes we don't do a bone marrow biopsy. Oftentimes the diagnosis is made on clinical uh, and historical information, but if we do do a bone marrow biopsy, we see that the, there's an increased number of megakaryocytes, or the precursors of, uh, of platelets in the bone marrow. And this suggests both ineffective platelet production and a peripheral destruction. Hmm. We know that compared to HIV-negative individuals, the platelets survive in the peripheral blood for a, a shorter period of time. They've done radionuclide tracing studies of platelets on HIV-positive individuals, and the survival of a platelet is on the order of three days compared to approximately 10 days in an HIV-negative individual. The spleen sequesters platelets. It's part of its role, and it, it does that in an increased uh, capacity in patients who are HIV positive. And then we're, uh, patients who are HIV positive are less effective in delivering platelets from the bone marrow to the peripheral blood. In terms of peripheral destruction of platelets, this is largely due to antiplatelet antibodies. And it's interesting, the antibodies that target the HIV envelope glycoproteins, they cross-react with platelet glycoprotein complexes. So it creates sort of a, a molecular mimicry of these antibodies targeting platelets, which leads to an ITP phenomenon. Also, we know that CRP, C-reactive protein levels, it enhances IgA-mediated platelet destruction via enhanced phagocytosis, and levels of CRP, a marker of inflammation, are elevated among patients with, with HIV. So th these are two of the ways that platelets are destroyed in, in the peripheral blood at higher rates than in HIV-negative individuals. And then there's a decreased production. There's a production issue from the bone marrow, the factory that produces the platelets, both from HIV infecting the megakaryocytes, which impairs subsequent maturation and development. There's increased apoptosis of these cells, so even though the numbers of megakaryocytes are increased, they are dying quicker than among patients who are HIV negative. There could be alterations in growth factor signaling, and there's just changes in a bone marrow environment that uh, lead to decreased production. Again, largely due to different inflammatory cytokines. The treatment is really some, is similar to what we do for HIV uninfected patients as well. So we try to discontinue marosuppressive medications as we're able and the initiation of antiretroviral therapy or modifications of that antiretroviral therapy as appropriate. And then that sometimes is sufficient for to make a resolution of the platelet count in patients. And then other treatments are dependent on the symptoms and the severity of the, of the patients. Typically, if the platelet count is less than 30,000, it triggers us to want to do something, given the increased risk of bleeding at that level and, and lower. So we have a number of different options. Steroids is, a, uh, is commonly used. A one, um, one dosing scheme would be using prednisone at one milligram per kilogram per day and giving a pulse dose of steroids for a, uh, a short period of time. Unfortunately, many patients, they do, don't respond for a long, long period of time, and they sometimes will require a longer um, a tapering schedule. IVIG, uh, which the dosing is one gram per kilogram. We can give Winro or anti-RH antibody in patients who are RH positive, and importantly, 
who do have a spleen. We can give rituximab, which um, targets the B cells to decrease antibody pr production. Some other agents are dapsone, which is used, which is interesting because that's also used in prophylaxis. So if that's an appropriate prophylaxis for a patient, that would be a reasonable option. Danazol, which is a synthetic androgen, we try not, we don't use that often, but it has been shown to be effective in refractory thrombocytopenia. Splenectomy is also a second line um, option or now a third line option in patients who are splenectomized. Um, and then increasingly, we're getting more experience with thrombopoietin agonists. Um, there's two agents on the market right now. One is an oral agent and one is a uh, parenteral agent. Um, Ramaplastum is the parental agent. l is the, the pill. It is showing, um, we don't have that much data on patients who are HIV infected with the use of these agents, but it's thought to be a, a potential option. But usually the first line still are uh, steroids, <coughs> IVIG, and um, anti-RH antibody. And so for neutropenia, and I'll answer, I can stop now and answer questions or just wait until, I'll just wait until the end and then answer any questions. So for neutropenia, the incidence is higher among patients on the first generation antiretrovirals, particularly patients who are on uh, AZT and a low CD4 count has, um, and the low CD4 count has decreased with the introduction of the more novel um, antiretroviral regimens. Again, the etiology is similar for thrombocytopenia, so medications, different pathogens, and we'll talk about those, including HIV itself, and malignancy. So medications associated with neutropenia are plenty, so chemotherapy, antivirals again, gancyclovir and Valgan, AZT, hydroxyurea, sulfa drugs, foscarnet, and pentamidine. There are, are, are others, these are the more common ones. There's plenty of infections associated with neutropenia as well. Mycobacterium avium, um, MTB, histoplasmosis, really any disseminated fungal infection can cause neutropenia or infect the bone marrow, EBV and CMV, parvovirus B19, which we typically think of causing a pure red cell aplasia, can cause pancytopenia, more likely to cause um, pancytopenia in patients with an underlying either hematologic malignancy or potentially HIV. Salmonella, uh, Leishmaniasis, and then HIV itself. So the management for neutropenia is, again, the discontinuation of marosuppressive medications, initiation of antiretroviral therapies, modifying by, I'm not sure if anyone's using AZT now, but taking that off if, if appropriate. We can alter prophylaxis as able, for example, replacing uh, sulfa with dapsone or atovaquone, treating the underlying infection or malignancy, and then I think something that we grapple about is when to use growth factor support. Mm -hmm. We know that, um, and I'll show some slides regarding growth factor support using GCSF, there is, in retrospective studies, there's data that shows that it, it decreases morbidity, mortality, and hospitalization, but prospective studies have not shown any benefit from a mortality perspective, but have shown some under other indices, which we'll talk about in the next few slides. So this was a uh, randomized control trial that was uh, that was done some years ago, and they looked at 258 HIV positive patients who had a neutrophil count between 750 and 1,000 neutrophils seven days prior to randomization and a CD4 count less than 200, a platelet count greater than 50,000, and a, a performance status which was greater than 50, and a life expectancy greater than equal to six months. Patients were randomized to either daily um, growth factor, GCSF or filgrastim, intermittent filgrastim, or placebo. The placebo patients, if they ever did get develop severe neutropenia, which was defined in the study as a neutrophil count greater than 500, they were then given GCSF. So uh, even the placebo group was. They were looking at uh, severe neutropenia, again defined as a neutrophil count greater or less than 500, death and the incidence of uh, various infections, the duration of hospitalization, and IV antibiotic use. And so this was their, the primary endpoints were 
severe neutropenia and death, you can see in this, um, in this table that um, for confirmed severe neutropenia and death, the patient, it was 12% in the uh, patients who received daily dosing, 8% in the um, intermittent dosing, and 34% in the control group. But if you separate the primary endpoints into the, the individual out in endpoints, specifically severe neutropenia and death, severe neutropenia, there was clearly a benefit in terms of the, the GCSF, where it was between 1% and 2% in the group that received the, um, the growth factor support and 22% in the group that did not. And that was a statistically significant response. But among patients with death, just looking at death as endpoint, there was not a significant response or benefit. This may be a little bit more difficult to see. The 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 black the black col uh, column are the is the control group. The the lined gray and white or black and white sort of. Uh, lines, those are the intermittent dosing, the solid gray is the um, daily dosing, and the white is everyone together. And the first box, which is this one, is bacterial infections per uh, 1,000 patient days. Block B is severe bacterial infections per 1,000 days. Block C is hospitalizations per 1,000 patients. and Block D is uh, bacterial infections related hospital days. And for all of these, there was a benefit in patients who received either the intermittent or daily filgrastum. There was some concern that using growth factor support and in preclinical data, there's some suggestion that it increases both viral load, giving a growth factor increases the HIV viral load and potentially decreases the CD4 count. They looked at that in this study with GCSF, and there was no difference. There was, it was not associated with an increase in plasma HIV um, RNA levels, nor was it inc uh, there was any change in the, in the CD4 count significant between these two groups. One of the dosing schemes that we use is uh, GCFS, so filgrastim, of a dose of one, between one to five micrograms per kilogram per day that we start, we titrate to a target of between 1,000 to 2,000, an A and C between that time, and we go up to 10 micrograms per kilogram per day. For some patients, we consider maintenance dosing. We're particularly, particularly keen on using um, growth factor support for patients who are undergoing chemotherapy for any HIV-associated malignancy because it allows us to deliver our dose of chemotherapy on time and on schedule, which we know is, a, is beneficial. We also sometimes do maintenance dosing for patients with, with GCSF. So back to this patient, again, she's a 45-year-old uh, woman who presents now with pancytopenia. Given, this, given her blood counts, she did have a, um, a, an HIV test which was positive, so a new diagnosis of, of HIV. And her case was a little complicated, so she ended up getting a bone marrow biopsy, hmm. which yielded our result of, of why this patient was, um, was uh, pancytopenic. So does anyone have any guesses as to why this patient was pancytopenic? Parvo. Very good. Parvo. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West HIV Project Echo Didactic Series. If you're interested in other talks, we invite you to subscribe to this YouTube channel. You can select the red subscribe button. You can also find additional talks by searching YouTube for MWATC Project Echo. Until next week's edition, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.